Good day, and welcome to DNA Genome Tech and Diversogen's webinar on overcoming challenges in skin microbiome research from sampling to analysis. My name is Hallie's Breton, and I will be your moderator for today. Before we start, we wanted to give you a brief overview of today's talk. Uh, so we will start by reviewing DNA Genome Tech's newest product, OmniGene Skin, for the sampling of skin microbiome. Uh, we'll quickly look at how this device can be used to profile various different sites. Uh, then we'll move on and present to you some of the validation data for this product, which will demonstrate uh, sample stability. We'll also look at how you can optimize your sample processing workflows to obtain better results, and also look at some of the bio-burden testing and quantitative performance data for this product. Then we'll move on to the Diversogen's V4 and V1V3 analytical skin pipeline, and then open it up for a Q&A. First, let me introduce our speakers for today. Our first speaker will be Brice Lefrançois. Brice is the microbiome team lead scientist at DNA Genotech. He has extensive exp expertise in molecular biology, microbiome sample collection and processing, and DNA and RNA extractions. For the past two years, he's been leading multiple research projects at DNA Genotech, including the development of the OmniGene skin device he'll be discussing today. Prior to joining DNA Genotech, Bryce obtained a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Ottawa and has more than eight years of experience in academic research across a wide range of fields, including cancer and neurobiology. Our second speaker today is Daryl Gold. Daryl is the senior scientific advisor at Diversogen and was one of the co-founders of CoreBiome, which is now under the Diversogen banner. Dr. Gol is, is also the head of the University of Minnesota Genomics Center's Innovation Lab, as well as a research assistant professor in the Department of Genetics, Cell Biology, and Development. Daryl holds a PhD in molecular biology from Princeton University. His years of research have contributed to the development and improvement of amplicon-based microbiome profiling methods, as well as a novel shallow shotgun sequencing approach. Now, without further ado, I'll hand it over to our speakers. Thank you, Eloise, for the kind introduction. And my part of the talk today is going to be focused on addressing the challenges in human skin microbiome collection and processing. So when you're looking at the human skin, you're looking at a wide diversity of collection sites, and each of these sites tend to support different microbial community. And typically, you can subdivide the human skin into three main groups. So you've got sebaceous skin or oily skin, and that's typically the face, scalp, or the chest. And there's also wet or moist skin, which would be like toe webs or any body folds, really. And then there's dry skin, so that would be hands, arm, and legs. In general, skin is very low in nutrients, and as such, it has very low relative microbial abundance. So for human skin, we're typically talking of somewhere between 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 bacterial cells per square centimeter of skin. And dry skin, which is the lowest biomass skin site, tends to be on the lower end of that range, while sebaceous skin is closer to like 10 to the 9. And just keep in mind that it's very it's several order of magnitude below what you typically encounter on other human uh, microbiome sites, such as the oral uh, cavity or the gut. And since skin is such low biomass, environmental contaminant and bio burden, so bio burden is background DNA contamination that would be coming either from the collection device itself or the extraction kit, can, can actually be significant issues in, in your analysis. And to this day, there is a lack of a standardized mean to collect skin microbiome sample. And there's two main methods that are being used by researchers out there. So one of them is swabbing, where you're using a swab. And some people argue that swabbing is not as good because you're only going to be collecting the surface microbiome. And the second approach is to use tape stripping, so using a sticky tape to like, capture the bacteria that are present on the human skin, and that allows you to do deeper sampling. But extraction can be a challenge from tape stripping because it's very hard to like dislodge the captured microbial cells from uh, the, uh, the sticky tape. So we decided to leverage like all the internal knowledge that exists at DNA Genotech on microbiome collection devices. And we developed OmniGene Skin, which is a swab-based skin microbiome collection device. 
And it's a very simple device. So as you can see, it consists of a flux fab with a breakpoint, an omni-gene collection tube, so that contains one mil of stabilization buffer, and also a wetting solution that's going to be used to make and describe prior to collection. And included in InchKit 2 is like our optimized instruction for use. And they don't look like much, but we spent a lot of time developing those IFUs because we wanted to make sure that the end user collecting the sample at home was going to do as good of a job as possible. And as you can see, the steps are very simple. You take the collection tube out of its packaging, same for the swab, then dunk the swab into the waiting solution before collecting uh, the sample from the site of interest. And I think that's a key step where we're asking the end user to like, collect for a total of 60 seconds while applying a lot of pressure. And applying that pressure and the increased collection time is really making sure that you're going to be capturing as many of the microbial cell on the skin surface as possible, and it's going to answer like, good performance in downstream analysis. Very early on in the development of Omnigen Skin, we realized that it was paramount that we would develop workflows that would be able to overcome low biomass. And we needed to make sure that we had appropriate workflows so that we would get enough DNA from any skin site that we want to sample. And we ended up developing two workflows that are shown here in this figure, where you start with an Omnigen skin sample and you do a protein SK treatment for one hour at 50 degrees, where you've got the swab sitting in a stabilization solution. That step is going to help releasing bacteria into the stabilization liquid so that it's available for like, downstream extraction. And when it comes to extraction, there's two ways of processing the samples. The one that we recommend is using PowerFuco Pro which is a Kyogen kit that works very well for most microbiome sample. And we suggest that people concentrate the one mil uh, of sample down to 250 so that you can process the entire sample in one step. But we also developed like, our own extraction protocol, so DNA Genotech in-house protocol, where you can skip that concentration step and take the entire one mil stabilized sample straight into a bit beating tube, and then you can isolate the DNA using like silica columns. And as you can see on the graph here, showing you typical yields we get from several skin sites using both workflows, we were able to achieve like significant DNA yields from each of the skin sites that we sample. So for sebaceous skin, whether it's scalp or the face, you see that on average we recover somewhere between 100 to 200 nanogram per uh, kit, which is, uh, which is pretty good. For like forearm, which is dry skin, so very, very low biomass, you see that the yields are much lower. We're talking about 10 to 20 nanogram per kit, but it's still like pretty good when it comes for like dry skin. And then wet, moist skin sites, you see that it's very donor and site dependent. So we did see pretty high yields for some donor for toe webs, but in general, axilla or the armpit were much lower. And included in any of our experiments are environmental control. So environmental controls are uncollected kits that go through the extraction. And as you can see, our environmental controls gave very, very low DNA yield, which indicates that the bio burden in our collection device is pretty low. And it's also important to point out that the yields that we typically got from collected sample from any site were 95% of the time higher than those environmental control, which really uh, indicates that we're collecting the material that's present on the skin surface of the donor. The next thing that we did was check the performance of the extracted DNA in Amplicon sequencing applications, so both 16S and ITS. And in this graph, I'm showing you final library quants. For examples that were amplified with 16S ITS for like face, the web, and forearm. And as you can see, we got pretty robust uh, amplification and library final library points uh, for both 16S and ITS for toe web and face. We saw slightly less amplification for like 16S for forearm samples, but that's expected because yields are significantly lower. But importantly, again, when you do the same PCR amplification on the environmental control, you see that the final yields are very, very low. And that's again showing that the bio burden in our kits are very, very low. We barely detect any amplification with 16 so anything that you're generating in those libraries corresponds to materials that was extracted from the skin of your donor. So the next thing that we wanted to do was to check that Omnigen skin can capture the site-specific bacterial and fungal profile. And here I'm just showing you bar plots, showing the relative abundance 
of the genera that we detected for like several skin sites. So all of our data was generated using 16S taxonomy profile using V3V4. And as you can see for face and scalp, for most donors, it's dominated by QT bacterium, or also known as uh, propionibacterium. bacterium. Well, when you look at the toe web, you see that it's a different story, and there's two genera that are dominating the samples. So you've got Staphylococcus in gray and Corinibacterium here in uh, beige. And Corinibacterium is expected to be seen on moist skin site because it's a moist loading bacteria. And in general, if you look at the profile that we generated from our omnigene skin samples, they're very much in line with what's been reported in the literature in the past. So you see, for example, that when you do sampling of sebaceous skin site, it's mostly dominated by propionibacterium. Whereas when you look at toe web or dry skin site, it's a different story. And you see, for example, corinibacterium and staph in the toe web, just like we did. So that's really good because we're capturing the specificity of each of these sites. And this is like the same data, but showing you the ITS2 uh, taxonomy profile and the relative abundance of fungal uh, genera. And you see that forearm, face, and scalp samples tend to be noted, dominated by mouse asia. So it's a skin commensal, a genus that's like very well established to reside on the skin of humans. And as you can see, it's like the most abundant fungal species across most samples. But again, the toe web samples were quite different, uh, quite different, and we were able to see like a greater diversity of fungal signatures and genera in them. And that's again something that's been reported in the literature. So omnigen skin really can capture like site-specific fungal and bacterial profile. We like our optimized uh, processing workflow. We were able to achieve like pretty high yields for like select skin sites, so mostly face, scalp, and like toe web. So we decided to do whole genome sequencing on a subset of those samples, and I'm showing you in that graph the. Uh, taxonomic profile and the relative abundance. And as you can see, the data is quite similar to what we saw with like 16S amplification. And you see that face and scalp samples, which are like sebaceous, are dominated by propiony bacterium or QT bacterium again. But you see that in general, the proportion of QT bacterium is higher than what we saw with 16S. And it is likely because we don't have any PCR bias when we're doing a WGS sequencing. And when you look at the toe web samples, again, you see that it's mostly dominated by two species. And those two species are going to be Staphylococcus and uh, Corinibacterium in green, as expected. And if you start to look at the clustering you by PCA plot, you can start seeing that each of the site is going to cluster, and each site is clustering with itself. So you see that the toe web samples tend to cluster on the right end of the plot, whereas face and scalp, which are highly similar, tend to be found on the left side. But you're still able to like start seeing like differences between the scalp and the face, which is really exciting. And that's what shotgun gives you like better resolution into uh, what's present on those different sites. And since uh, propionic bacterium is like very well known to play a role in acne, we decided to look in more details into our shotgun data, and we were able to identify up to 20 unique C acne strains in those samples, which is like very exciting. And we decided then to like organize those 20 unique strains based on their ribotype. So the ribotype is shared 16S sequences and strains that are very closely related tend to share their, ribo, uh, their 16S sequences. And as you can see, when you look at our 10 donors, they're mostly dominated by ribotypes 1, 2, and 3, which is expected in healthy donors, but we were also able to detect ribotype 4 and 5, which are known to be enriched in acne uh, patients. And here they're low because we're looking at uh, skin samples from healthy individuals. So over the next few slides, I'll take you through some of the data that we generated during the validation of our Omnigen skin. And as I mentioned in the introduction, like skin has very low microbial loads. So you cannot sample the same site twice because you're going to end up depleting microbial cells in your, in the first collection. And for like optimal results in downstream assays, you, you really want ideally to process for example, in a single extraction. So we had to be a bit creative to validate the omnigene skin. And what we ended up doing is we chose to collect bird samples from the left and the right side of the face of healthy donors. 
and we use like 20 donors per condition. And we use those sample pairs to like assess profile stability and neutrality. And what we were doing is that one of the two samples was extracted at baseline, and that was considered to be the ground truth, while the other one was extracted post-challenge, and challenge would be either simulated shipping or extended storage at room temperature. So just to give you an idea of simulated shipping conditions that we tested, we did 50 degrees for one day, 37 degrees for three days, or three cycles of free thaw, and here is a room temperature storage for like 30 days. But what you need to establish first is what is the biological variability, because we cannot expect the left and the right side of the same individual to be exactly identical. So that's what we did. And we measure the profile like differences across our sample pairs. And in that case, biological variability, everything was extracted at baseline. Each dot represents a single donor, and you see that the biological variability is overall quite low. And it's much lower than the donor-to-donor -donor variability, where you're comparing the unique profile of each donor. And when you look at the different conditions that we tested for stability, you clearly see that following similar to shipping conditions or like room temperature storage for up to 30 days, we don't see an increase in the variability, which is like an indication that overall the profile is stable in those donor uh, through those conditions. And I'm still going to show you some 16S taxonomic profile from those very samples to convince you that we have good profile stability. So this is three representative donors where I'm showing you baseline versus uh, storage at room temperature for 30 days. And overall, you see that the uniqueness of each donor profile is maintained during storage at room temperature for 30 days. And the samples are not exactly identical, but keep in mind that in our experimental design, we use per sample left and right. So we, we knew that the samples were not always going to be fully identical. And this is a taxonomic bar plot showing you relative abundance at baseline uh, or following uh, 37 degree incubation for like three days. And you see that there is no significant change in the profile for any of the donors. And we're able to maintain the stability of the profile uh, even when we're incubating at a temperature that could promote bacterial growth. One other important thing that we wanted to measure was uh, we wanted to make sure that omnigene skin was not going to be introducing any detectable bias in the microbial profile. So we did that using a very similar approach as what we did for stability. And we collected the samples from 20 donors per samples in either omnigene skin or PBS and measured like, the variability at baseline. And as you can see, when you compare variability in PBS versus omnigene skin, there's no significant differences, meaning that our collection into our device is not introducing any kind of profile bias. And the variability that we're seeing in both cases is much lower, again, than the donor-to-donor -donor variability. So we also tested fungal profile neutrality and stability. We chose not to do ITS sequencing because the fungal DNA that you get in a typical a skin sample is very, very low. It's only a fraction of the total DNA. So what we ended up doing is using like spiking of M. globosa, Malsasia globosa, which is like a very well-known skin commensal. And a live culture of M. globosa was spiked into collected uh, paired face samples from eight donors. And then we measure the uh, amount of M globosa by qPCR at baseline or following like simulated transport. So free thaw, 50 degrees or 37, and also room temperature for 30 days. And you see that overall, we don't see any shift in the amount of signal that we're recovering, which is indicating that the fungal uh, profile remains stable over time and during transport. And we also tested neutrality for fungal. So again, we collected in omnigene skin versus PBS. And you see that we see no differences in the, the amount of M. globosa we're able to detect, meaning that we're not shifting the fungal profile or the bacterial profile when collecting sample in omnigene skin. So one of the things that we also wanted to do was to like, compare omnigene skin performance to like other like swab-based skin collection devices. And we did that by collecting in cheek or like forearm sample in omnigene skin or devices from competitor C or competitor N. We did that for eight donors. And as you can see, when we collected cheek samples or forearm samples 
into omnigenes skin, we consistently saw the two to three fold more uh, DNA that was recovered uh, during the instruction than with a competing device. And two to three fold may not seem like very much, but when you start looking at forearm, which is dry skin, where the biomass is as low as it gets when it comes to skin, uh, a significant proportion of the samples that were collected in competing devices were actually indistinguishable from the environmental control, so uncollected kit. And that's not the case at all for Omnigen skin, where like over 85% of the samples that were collected were at DNA concentration that were well above of the environmental control. And I think that's really like... Uh, truly indicating that omnigen skin is optimized for low biomass sampling uh, and other swab-based devices are not. So we also measured like 16S copy number in uh, cheek samples that were recovered uh, when you sampled using omnigen skin or competitor C or N. And as you can see, we were able to show that we've got improved bacterial DNA recovery. And that's really important because it shows that not only are we getting higher yields, but we're actually getting higher bacterial yields, which means that there's going to be more bacterial representation in those profiles, and that's better success in any downstream uh, application. So I hope that I've been able to convince you that the Omnigen Skin is the only validated skin collection device out there. And we've been able to validate its performance for the major type of skin sites, so sebaceous, wet, and dry. We've like developed optimized workflow to maximize DNA yields from low biomass sample. And that's really to ensure that there's going to be an increased success in any downstream application. Overall, our kit has a low bio burden, which is good because that means that you can even collect from dry skin where biomass is extremely low. And background DNA contamination is not going to be a big, big issue. Uh, Omnigen skin is able to capture and stabilize a human skin microbiome during transport at ambient temperature and storage for 30 days at room temperature, and that's both bacterial and fungal profile. And importantly, it outperforms all the other swab based collection devices that we've tested. We're seeing better yields and improved bacterial DNA recovery. And I think the key of improved yields on bacterial DNA recovery is going to give you consistent performance in next generation sequencing pipelines. So we saw a 100% success rate in uh, ITS and 16S amplicon sequencing, but we also yield, uh, we also were able to isolate enough DNA to enable uh, shotgun sequencing on select higher biomass skin sites, such as like face scalp or like toe web, and then you can start taking like a look, a deeper look at uh, the microbiome strains uh, of bacteria, et cetera. So more out of those samples really. And now I'll like pass on the presentation to like Daryl, which is gonna talk more about the challenges in skin microbiome analysis. Well, thank you, Bryce. I'm gonna talk today about um, some of the work that we've been doing at Diversogen on the library prep and sequencing portions of uh, the skin microbiome profiling workflow. So as with the human gut, uh, diversity of the skin microbiome is often associated with skin health. Um, and there, there are also a number of uh, key taxa that can have very large ro roles um, and influences on skin health and disease. Uh, Bryce mentioned one in particular, Cutobacterium, um, which is often a, a high, high frequency um, or highly abundant component of the skin microbiome in many body sites. So Bryce did a really nice job of uh, talking through the optimizations that have been done in DNA Genotech with the Omnigene Skin product uh, to optimize sample collection and storage for skin microbiome samples. Um, a lot of the challenges that he highlighted, the fact that skin microbiome tends to be very low biomass and also has uh, often high levels of host, host DNA present as well. Um, th these are also challenges for, for sequencing the skin microbiome, um, in particular for, for doing shotgun sequencing. Uh, there are a number of other uh, kind of issues uh, with respect to being able to recover and, and re recover key taxa uh, such as ketobacterium um, using applicant approaches uh, that, that we've done a lot of work on optimizing. So I'm going to tell you about those today. And one, one of the real advantages that we have in working with DNA Genotech is, is that we're able to um, co-develop and co-optimize methods for, for collection 
and 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 the downstream processing. And so um, one of the areas that we've done that is is on extraction of the DNA from skin. And so so Bryce had mentioned a, a method that was kind of developed internally at DNA Genotech and optimized for for extraction of samples from these Omnigene skin kits. Um, we've implemented those methods at Diversigen, and this is some of the data on a variety of different uh, samples collected from different body sites, uh, showing that we can we can get get these robust yields, um, ro robust DNA yields from from these samples from different body sites. And this is just a summary of of data from a variety of different sites where you know as. Rice had mentioned the sebaceous or wet tissues that that have higher higher biomass, higher microbial load, um, tend to correlate with with better extraction success. But in general, um, the, the the impact of of the, this co optimization of, of both collection and extraction um, yields to an increased rate of successful collection, and so so fewer sample dropouts in your studies, and the ability to access. Uh, at least for certain tissues, um, both um, 16S sequencing and also potentially uh, shotgun sequencing. So there's been a, a lot, a lot of work done in the field on looking at the impact of different variable regions on analyzing the skin microbiome. Um, this is data from a nice paper from Elizabeth Grice's lab from a few years back, um, where they showed that. Uh, had different performance for analyzing the skin microbiome. Um, in particular, uh, they saw a dropout of, or, of one of these critical taxa, bacterium acnes or propionobacterium acnes, when using V4 primers. Um, they also noted that V1, V3, um, because of the, the, um, the, the larger target size, the increased number of polymorphisms within it than the V1B3 variable origin did a better job of classifying certain taxa. So in this example, um, S. epidermidis was, was able to be classified to the species level of V1B3, um, but, but only classified as Staphylococcus genus um, using B4. Um, so over the last several years, we've done a lot of work, um, both at Diversigen and, and um, also, also my work at the University of Minnesota, on optimizing skin microbiome or optimizing 16S um, amplicon-based uh, microbiome profiling methods. Um, this is data from a paper that we published a few years back, um, looking at the performance of you know other methods that are commonly used in the field, like like the EMP or HMP methods uh, for for 16S microbiome profiling versus um, an optimized method that we've developed, um, where we really tried to optimize the, the molecular biology. Uh, to, to generate more accurate microbiome profiles. And this, this is data from uh, different organisms. Um, the expected values are, are shown as dashed line here. And what you can see is that uh, these optimizations that we've introduced really helps to, to generate a much more accurate microbiome profile. And one of the things that I'll highlight is that we also saw, you know, as, as with the, the previous data that I showed from, from the Grace Lab, we also saw a near complete um, dropout of P acnes. So this is a log scale. So, so um, with, with with some of these existing methods, um, P acnes is, is hundreds of fold underrepresented in, in this data set. Um, and what you can see is that with some of the optimizations that we've introduced, um, we're actually able to rescue that that dropout of P acnes. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about how we how, how that works and how we did that. Um, so so in this publication we laid out a number of best practices for generating amplicon-based microbiome data. Um, these included some kind of straightforward molecular optimizations to improve the quantitative accuracy, um, such as minimizing PCR cycle number and optimizing DNA template concentration to really try to um, reduce the effects of PCR biases. Um, using a highly processive polymerase, which, um, which helps to really reduce the amount of uh, PCR chimeras that are formed. And then we also uncovered something that was relatively unexpected, um, which is uh, some, uh, the ability to um, improve also the qualitative accuracy of these methods by minimizing the dropout of taxa. And the way that we did this was by um, incorporating a proofreading polymerase, which you know we, we, we thought might 
help to minimize substitution errors and, and decrease the error rate in sequencing and, and you know, improve your ability to reliably classify organisms. Um, but it also had the unexpected effect of um, enabling something that we've, that we've dubbed primer editing. And, and um, we uncovered this actually in looking at uh, P. acnes or C. acnes in this mock community where we saw that um, the, the reason that uh, this organism tends to drop out in, in analysis using the V4 variable region is that there's a mismatch between the, the V4 primer sequences, both the forward and reverse V4 primers, and the C. acnes 16S template sequence. And th this mismatch basically um, completely abolishes the ability to amplify this, this organism typically. Um, and what we found is that by incorporating this proofreading polymerase, um, we're actually able to get um, chewback of these primer sequences and correction of the, the primers to match the template sequence. And we can see that when we look at the, the, the sequencing reads and we look at the region corresponding to the primer sequences, we see a, a, um, an A to G and a T to G change that, that match the, the C. acnes template sequence. Um, when we when we use a proofreading polymerase, but not when we use a, a, an enzyme like TAC polymerase that doesn't have this three prime to five prime mix in nucleus activity. And so what the the impact, you know, the, the result of this is that we're able to then use primer editing to recover a, a significant proportion of the expected P acnes or C acnes in, in this mock community sample. So we, we've seen this with other taxa as well. This is an example from primate microbiome study where um, there's this particular TM7 taxa that has also has a, a mismatch to the V4 amplification primers um, that we recover specifically when we when we incorporate primer editing, incorporate the, these molecular optimizations into our into our 16S analysis pipeline. Um, but this taxa is you know completely drops out when 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 not taking advantage of primer editing. So we've subsequently extended on these observations with respect to the skin microbiome. Um, this is work that, that's been done at Diversogen uh, by Amanda Stratano, one of our research scientists. And um, what we found is that for a variety of different body sites, uh, when, we, when we incorporate primer editing, incorporate proofreading polymerases into the, into the amplification process, we're able to rescue the, the detection of C. acnes um, to levels similar to what, what's detected with with V1, V3. And this is a, on, on the right is a plot of um, paired, paired donors um, analyzed either with, with V1, V3 or with V4. And these purple bars are, are the amount of ketobacterium that are detected in these samples. And what you can see is that we detect very similar levels um, of, of ketobacterium when, when using um, V4 as we do with V1, V3, as long as we've um, implemented the, these optimizations and, and, and enabled primer editing in these samples. So in addition to um, you know, the, the ability to detect P. acnes or C. acnes, um, there are some other trade-offs between using V4 and V1, V3 that are, that are worth considering in designing your microbiome studies. Um, so one of these is the, the improved taxonomic resolution that you get with V1, V3. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, th this is really a fact, a, a result of that in, in increased um, diversity or increased number of, of variable bases within the V1, V3 variable regions it gives you more resolving power. Um, this is visualized really nicely in, this, in these plots from this 2019 Nature Communications paper, um, where you can see that with V4, um, just because of the, the smaller target size and, and the lower entropy of these sequences, um, typically these can only be classified, most organisms can only be classified down to the genus level. Um, whereas with V1, V3, you get a lot more organisms that are able to be classified to the species level. Um, the trade-offs though are that there, there are some technical challenges in sequencing V1, V3. So this amplicon is really at the edge of, of what can possibly be um, analyzed using voluminous sequencing technology. Um, and so you, you tend to um, ha have some impacts on sequence quality and, and the ability to stitch, effectively stitch those reads together. 
Um, whereas with V4, because it's a, a shorter amplicon, you're able to basically sequence the entire amplicon in both directions, and, and that gives you improved sequence quality. Um, we've also found that longer amplicons tend to have systematically worse sequencing quality across a range of cluster densities. So for the sequencing aficionados out there, um, you may know that as you increase cluster density, increase yield, you tend to see lower quality scores. Um, and you can see that trend in, in these plots. Um, but what we found is that across a range of cluster densities for V1 and V3 tends to have lower sequencing quality than V4. And, and this can impact both, both your ability to, to stitch those reads together and, and the number of reads that you can effectively analyze in those samples. Um, and then ultimately your mapping and the reliability of your ability to map these reads to a database. So um, to, to sum up, um, you know, today Bryce and I have told you about um, work that we've been doing across this workflow to optimize the collection of skin samples and, and storage and stabilization of those samples. Um, work that we've done to optimize extraction yields and, and optimize the proportion of these samples that can be, that can be analyzed. Um, and then I've told you about the work that we've done to optimize uh, 16S profiling methods. Um, in particular, incorporation of primer editing, which allows you to expand the number of taxa that you can detect with the, with the given primer set. And for skin, this is really critical, at least uh, when using V4, because it, it allows you to detect um, ketobacterium acnes, which, which normally would, would drop out of this analysis. And uh, you know, the, these improved extraction yields um, allow us to not only have to access a lot of these samples for, for 16S or, or amplicon sequencing, um, but also open up the possibility of doing um, shotgun sequencing uh, on a large number of samples. And so at Diversigen, um, we're, we're currently offering both V4 and V1, V3 analysis for skin microbiome samples. Um, and we have a, we have a data two based uh, ASV analysis pipeline um, for, for doing the actual um, uh, classification and, and, and analysis of that data. So uh, with that, I think uh, Bryce and I are happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Perfect. So we've already received some questions through. Um, and I think the first, Bryce, is probably best directed at you. Um, so actually, we had a few questions here, um, which all concerned um, other uses for omnigene skin, so either other omics or other sample types, so non-human or even viral work. Um, so don't know if you want to address those in a bundle. Uh, yeah, I, I probably can. So first question that we have is, is a stabilization buffer in omnigene skin uh, compatible with other omic analysis, so proteomics, transcriptomics? Uh, so the chemistry that's in our tube is compatible with RNA and we've tried looking at RNA from skin bacteria and to make a sh long story short, I believe that we were able to get some RNA out of the highest biomass skin sites and the quality was pretty good, but I do believe that biomass being so uh, low on skin, it's very hard to get enough RNA for transcriptomics in general. But if someone was to look at the expression of like a given transcript and use a qPCR assay, I think that would be something that would be completely feasible. So a targeted approach instead of doing like full RNA-seq. And as far as proteomics, I think it's, uh, it's something we've never looked at. Our chemistry tend to be lytic, so I would say that protein would not remain intact, but we haven't really looked at that. And the second question, so did we consider like uh, sampling like animals, so pets? Uh, I think that would be, that's not something we've done, but based on the data that we got from the scalp, I would expect that the performance is gonna be about the same that as what we saw with a human scalp. And like we would be actually really interested in finding out if anyone tries. Perfect, thank you. And we actually had two questions here uh, regarding the, the wetting uh, of the swab prior to collection and, and different potential compositions of uh, wetting buffers. So I don't know if you wanna comment on our experience with uh, wetting swabs and wetting buffers. 
So yes, so the first question is about using a low concentration of a detergent. So this is something that was part of the original uh, HMP protocol. So SCF1 does contain like twin 20. Uh, we've compared the performance of SCF1 to the weighting agent we're using in the final uh, form factor in our kit, and we didn't see much of a difference. So we're not currently using uh, um, a detergent in the weighting agent, but we've seen similar performance. So we felt that it was not a requirement. And the second question is, is a wet swabbing the key to increase yield versus competitors? So the answer is going to be no. For the competitor collection, we ended up following the HMP uh, collection protocol for skin. So we were actually using SCF1 for those collections and the swab was pre-wetted uh, same as Omnigen skin. So we believe that the real difference in terms of yield versus our competitors is uh, our policy optimization that we made around sample processing and extraction. So making sure that we get good release from the swab into the extraction, but then also using optimized workflow so that you get as much DNA as possible from every sample. Thank you. Uh, I see we actually have two regarding um, the primers, specifically V3, V4. So maybe this is uh, better uh, for you, Daryl. So we have one asking uh, whether we tested primers targeting V3, V4, commonly used for human microbiome, and the reason why we don't use V3, V4 for 16S sequencing. Yeah, so I mean, there, there's quite a menu of different variable regions out there, um, you know, different different fields, different you know groups have, have settled on different variable regions for, for different reasons. I mean, with skin, you know, there, there's, there's um, definitely some advantages, you know, to, to, to using certain variable regions for resolving, you know, certain taxa that are common on the skin microbiome. Um, so we, we, we have, or, you know, I, I in the past have experienced running a whole bunch of different variable regions. Um, you know, in, in academic work that we've done at the University of Minnesota. Um, we're also in the process of kind of doing a very systematic sweep of, of um, all the different regions that are, that are commonly used in the, in the literature against, you know, a, a variety of different sample types. Um, and, and so, you know, while, while that's something that, you know, we're, we're not currently offering at Diversogen, you know, I, I think that, you know, in, in, in the future, you know, we, we might well be uh, kind of expanding that menu of, of variable regions. Um, in general, you know, all, all, all of these variable regions are going to have, you know, kind of similar trade-offs and limitations where they'll be good for some, good for resolving some taxa and not for others. Um, and really, you know, in, in order to get down to that, you know, kind of species or strain level resolution, um, you know, one, one often needs to, to or to be able to do that reliably, one needs to kind of take a shotgun sequencing approach. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I see we have a, another one, Bryce, that might be for you um, regarding uh, the bio burden that is present in the collection system. So the question is asking, um, uh, it looks like some sites have the same realm uh, as the DNA concentration and how we can comment on the bio burden present in the kit. And if we know where it's coming, yeah, I think that's an excellent question, and that's really an issue that's going to be popping up for anyone that's doing low biomass sampling. And when it comes to skin, when you're looking at dry skin, so forearm or legs, for example, we're only talking about a few thousand bacteria per square centimeter. And if you make the conversion in the sheer amount of DNA you can extract, from such a sample that would be like a few nanograms. So bio burden is definitely going to be an issue. And, and for those, for samples collected from the farm, even in omnigene skin, the yields were extremely low. So we're talking about 10 to 20 nanogram uh, per kit for the entire sample site. So that's very low. At the same time, for like over 80% of the samples, those DNA quants were higher than the environmental controls. And we did the testing downstream for amplification with ITS and 16S. We did see big differences in the final yield. So that means that the bio burden is not always DNA that's going to be amplifiable by PCR, which is good when you're using targeted sequencing uh, 16S and ITS in that case. 
In terms of where that bio burden is going to be coming, so we're asking the donor to collect from his skin inside his home for like a, a minute. There's the DNA that's coming from that step, so we have a breaking point, but donors could be like touching uh, the swab below the breaking point and end up contaminating. We can touch surfaces. In general, if you do a good job during the collection, there's going to be very, very low amount of contaminating DNA. And that's good because I mean that, as I was saying, bio burden is overall low, but not completely absent in our kits. And another source of bio burden, which is significant, and there's no way around it, is the extraction kit. So you're going to have to be extracting the DNA from those samples. And every extraction kit, there's a few papers showing that there's a ketone, which is basically the DNA coming from the extraction kit. And I think again, like the, the, the only point I can stress is that if somebody is interested in doing skin sampling and so on, you just have to make sure that the sample is collected as well as possible so that you're gonna have as much DNA collected from that site as possible so that your downstream analysis is successful really. And I think this might be a one for, for both of you, since both of you took part in, in validation and in analysis that happens at Diversogen. Um, so we had a question that was submitted prior to, um, to the, the webinar uh, regarding how to increase um, the microbiome signal versus the human signal. And then we had a question submitted during as well uh, regarding whether um, the human sequences were removed for analysis. So I don't know if, if how you guys want to tackle that one. <laughs> I think Daryl is probably a better place to answer those than I would be. Yeah, so um, in general, you know, the, we, we do have a host removal step in our analysis pipeline. And so that, that's one of the things that you contend with, with, you know, doing shotgun sequencing in the skin is that there, there can be a, a large amount of host material. Um, you know, I, I know there's been work at, at DNA Genotech on, on, you know, host depletion methods, which, um, you know, have have some trade offs and have you know mixed uh, you know, success in in being able to to actually deplete host in 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 sort of an unbiased way that's not changing the the profile of your sample. Um, and so, in general, you know, a, a, a good solution is just to basically um, use use brute force and and you know sequence these samples a little more deeply. Um, one of the things that uh, that that Helly's mentioned in the introduction was the shallow shotgun approach that we've um, that we've pioneered at, at initially at Corbiome and now at Diversogen. And uh, that approach really has uh, some nice advantages when it comes to doing shotgun sequencing in, in samples that have a lot of host contamination or have, have you know, low biomass or the, 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 you know, where you don't have the ability to get a, a huge number of reads that are mapping um, to, to bacteria because that, that data effectively always is then shallow data when it, with, with respect to the, the, the microbiome component of the sample. Um, and so some of the optimized pipelines, the, the optimized mapping workflows um, that we use for that shallow shotgun data um, can be really useful for analyzing skin samples. So, so where, where you basically, would, the, the, the process is to do a, initially do a host removal step to get rid of the, the human reads and then to use these optimized um, alignment methods to, to get as much signal as you can from that shotgun data. Thanks. Um, I did see we had some uh, some questions also regarding, you know, uh, our experience with very specific um, diseases and, and health statuses or, or special um, use cases. And I, I'm, I'm just going to jump in as, as product manager here and comment that obviously we haven't tested across the board for all of the different potential um, health statuses and, and diseases out there, uh, we, we have some studies on the go. Uh, but anybody who has a specific um, study that they want to run, because that's your research interest, um, we are more than happy uh, to provide you some sample kits so that you can start uh, testing this, this new method and see if it works specifically for you. And we will help you troubleshoot um, from, you know, from collection to analysis, since we have um, the expertise in house clearly as presented uh, during this webinar. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there. Um, and I think that's it for the live questions. I'm just going to give one more check to see what we have. 
And we, we did get asked if we would share the slides and don't worry, everybody who is still here, we will be sharing the, the slides at some point so you can see those. I believe we'll be uh, diffusing the, the, the presentation at some point as well uh, for everyone to watch again. So I'll just give it another minute in case there are any additional questions that come through. And uh, we want a big, big thank you to everyone for, for taking part today. Thank you to Daryl and, and Bryce for presenting. This was great. And I uh, appreciate everyone's time. So nothing else has come through so far. Uh, if, you, if anybody does have additional questions, uh, you can definitely reach out to DNA Genetech or Diversogen. We've got lots of different options on our websites uh, for you to get in touch and we'll be happy to answer your questions that way. And we've also displayed a link um, so that if you're interested in trying the Omnibeam kit, um, Omni skin kit that we've just mentioned today, uh, you can click on there or again, just visit the DNA Genetech website and we'll put you in touch with the right people to hand you those. And with that, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.